Chapter 7, Transactions. Transactions is a very important concept for us to deal with all kinds of issues that can happen in our stack. Think about many issues like there could be memory issues, there could be disk failures, there could be network issues, there could be application crashes, there could be multiple concurrency issues that can happen that would be important for us to detect and also tell our, our users to retry when there is a failure. So transaction is that abstraction that gives us that clear understanding of whether certain things happened or certain transaction successfully happened or certain transactions successfully could not happen. So there are a lot of guarantees that we depend on, especially from our databases. And those are ACID properties, right? So let's go into some of those guarantees that we depend and see if those are really supported, right? So ACID, A for atomicity, it's basically saying when, when I update a set of records, is everything actually going through or is only half of those updates going through? When, when it provides all or nothing kind of guarantees, we say it's atomic, right? Um, and it, we say that the database has the atomicity as its property. But when it doesn't provide that abortability or that all or nothing, then we don't say it's atomic, right? So that's number one. It's very important. Think about it. If you're trying to book an airline ticket with a specific seat, with a specific time, and a specific preference on your meal and others, and let's say the meal preference goes through, the time goes through, but you never get a seat because there someone just took your seat or that there's no other seat and there's only one seat available. What kind of a state is that database in, right? You, you got a confirmation, your money was taken out of your credit card, but that shouldn't have gone through. It's either all or nothing. I get all my preferences or I don't get any of it, right? That's what typically happens. There's no one user writing to one database with one record and reading it. One user might write to multiple tables with multiple records being updated and they all need to go through, not half of them. They all either, they don't need, either they're, they're not successful, they all need to be aborted, right? So, so that you can retry and repeatedly retry without side effects. So that is atomicity. Consistency is when we have foreign key references, unique constraints and others that the database provides. Isolation is the most important one. It's basically serializability. When, when I read something, am I reading something that is actually the current state? When I write something, am I writing it in the right serial fashion or multiple people are able to write the same record and it just overwrites each other? So isolation is the most important property in, uh, in transactions, which is basically nothing but serializability. Does my database provide mechanisms in which it serializes the operations and if not, it tells me as an application owner or the application stack upstream that, hey, there was a problem. Durability is basically saying when I when the database confirms that it, it stored the data, that it actually stored it, meaning if there is a hardware failure, I can still recover. If there is any issues uh, with uh, the machine or you know the, the multiple partitions and replicas are actually having the data so the failover is possible. So those are some of the guarantees that we depend on. The most important one is serializability and isolation. Um, so we will understand some of these properties and various levels of isolation that are provided by the database through this example. So the number one thing that uh, we're gonna learn about is uh, dirty reads. And then there's dirty writes, snapshot isolation for repeated reads, no lost updates, no write skews, no phantom reads, and how do we provide all that with certain serializability, with actual serialization, two-phase locking, and serializable isolation uh, through snapshots, right? So there are various algorithms. These are these algorithms. So now let's take a concrete example, make it all like really solid. Let's say there is this user who has $200 in their account, and there is a second user who has $500 in their account. And there are two different partitions. So let's assume that there are two different data instances on two different machines and their accounts on two different accounts, partitions. So this data is maintained here in account one, this is maintained here. Now let's say the first use case, user one wants to send $100 to user two, right? User one says, I wanna send $100 from my $200 to user two. So let's say that is number one transaction. And so what the first step that happens is it reduces minus 100, it reduces $100 from this 200 in this account. And then either the application or there's some mechanism in which this data is actually moved 
two accounts too. We said, hey, now you got a hundred dollars credit. Now let's say at this point, this instance dies. This database instance dies, right? So it just says a failure and then you don't get an acknowledgement. So the user sees that the, there was a failure. The money actually didn't go through, right? But at the same time, when this was going on, let's say this user has a summary page that shows the account balance. And so, in, so at this point, when the money actually has not gone through, if the user sees 100 instead of 200, because you know it's reading this data from this database, which has already reduced $100, then in this case, this is dirty read. It's reading data that was, uh, that was not fully committed, right? Either by itself or some other client. When you read data that is not committed, meaning you know it's not true that it will stay this way, then that is a dirty read. That's number one. That's the first thing. So database should not provide uh, dirty reads. It should have some sort of an isolation where it only provides the latest balance once this $100 actually reduced at this step. But until this reduction happens, it should continue to show $200, not $100. So that is number one, dirty reads. Now let's look at the second one, dirty writes, right? Dirty writes is basically overwriting. Uh, partially uh, uh, committed data, not fully committed data. So when, when this user is going through this, and then uh, let's say this user says, hey, I wanna, I wanna see my balance, right? And when they see 600, because it says, oh, you got 100, but actually didn't fully get it, then that's again saying dirty read. But then now if the user says, I'm gonna take out $600, because it sees that it has 600, only having 500, but able to take out 600, Right? Now you are overwriting this data that's in your account, which has only 500, but now you can say, hey, I'm gonna take out 600, I'm gonna overwrite it to zero. When you do that, when you overwrite partially committed data um, uh, or not fully committed uh, records, then that is uh, dirty rights, right? So that again should not have happened, right? Unless you have confirmation that this, this, you have 600, you should not be able to take out $600 from your account, right? So that is dirty rights. These are all concurrency issues. We're gonna go one, one by one, each one of them. But basically you shouldn't read data that is not accurate. You shouldn't write to data that is uh, not completely accurate or not current, right? So that's dirty right. How do you how do you provide guarantees against these issues? You do that by snapshot isolation, right? And that is what we call repeated reads or read committed, right? And so basically, the user here, this database should provide a means in which it has two different copies, right? One is the subtracted value and one is the original value. It should only show 200, continue to show 200 until the value is actually removed. That isolation is important, uh, which gives you this, this third point, which is snapshot level isolation. So that when you read, uh, you read that is committed um, and then you read repeatedly, it's still the same, right? Think about it, when you're trying to do this balance uh, reduction and then you're trying to take a snapshot of this database, what should it get? Should it get the minus 100 value here for this user, meaning only 100 or should it get 200? So until it's committed, until these transactions are committed, the snapshots, right, uh, that you are gonna take for these databases, right, should be consistent. It should be only the committed versions. So database should be able to provide that. That is snapshot level isolation no lost updates right basically this is the overriding thing let's say transaction one failed this is number one 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 fail and it goes to the user right but at the same time let's say this person says uh, i want to transfer 500 dollars user two says i want to transfer 500 dollars to user two and let's say these two transaction come at the same time right it, it passes the fact that, hey, there's $400, $500 being transferred from user two to user one. And it says that, hey, the minus 100 is actually failed. Now let's say uh, uh, the 400 goes through and it updates the database and it says, oh, you have 500 goes through and it says, oh, now you have 500. But then this one, number one, overwrites number four. And it says, now you only have 100 back, right? And it says, hey, minus 100. So you had 100, now I'm gonna give you back 100. So now you have 200. So this whole $500 is lost, right? Because it, the 500 number four transaction was overwritten by number one. That is lost updates. This update 
number four was lost because number one overwrote number four. That is a big problem. You just lost money, right? So that is lost updates. No right skews, right? Um, let's say here, this person says, hey, I have uh, $500 in my account and shows balance is uh, 500. Um, and it, uh, it, oh here, it, it shows 600, sorry. And then it says, I wanna take out that money. If, if you only had 500, but if you're able to take out 600, right? Basically, you, are, you, you said, I'm gonna take out 600 on the premise that I have 600, but that premise is falsified right here, right? So you should only be able to take out 500, but you're able to do it because your old condition that you read the data on, which is 600, is actually falsified because it actually failed here. Because if you read again, you'll only see 500. So that is right skews, right? Basically, your premise is false. It could be either your read is invalidated, because let's say there are same thing can apply to the airline example. You have one ticket available, one spot, and uh, let's say two different users update at the same time. And that's a problem, right? Um, so these are all concurrency types of issues. And you can see all of these can happen at various different points because this network level could have different levels of latencies between different networks, right? It could very well be that this network is a really fast network versus this is a very poor network, right? Um, so we talked about write skews and phantom reads, which basically saying whatever you are trying to read and write, the premise of that is invalidated. So you need to retry. If you're trying to book a meeting room, same thing. If you if you if you if you are saying I want to book this room, but and because you assume that that room is available in the earlier state, but someone has already booked it, but you still go ahead and book it because your database didn't tell you that it was already booked, and that's a problem. So that that leads to phantom reads, basically saying that there was a phantom read which said that hey the room was available or that there was more money in your data uh, in your account, but it was not true, and the database did not guarantee or safeguard you against it. So how do you solve all of this, right? You solve all of this by serialization, serialization or isolation, right? And so there are three different algorithms uh, and at various times, 1975, 1990, and now most recent 2009, various algorithms came in, actual serialization wherein you just have one CPU thread uh, process running uh, on one CPU core and just doing it all serially. If you make that one thread do that work, then you guarantee to have like, hey, uh, all of them is gonna happen in serial fashion. But that again is bottleneck on that CPU core and then only one partition per, you know, you could have, maybe at best you could have one partition, one thread update, but even there you have to be careful because it could be multiple partitions overwriting each other, right? So basically actual serialization is saying, I'm gonna just do it in sequence, right? There are a lot of problems and performance bottlenecks there. The other one is basically pessimistic locking, saying, hey, if, I, if someone's trying to book an airline ticket, the whole world should wait until that person finishes. That's a problem. Right, so that there is some ways in which two-phase lock when you acquire a big lock on various records that you want to update. Let's say you want to um, um, block a meeting room from one to two. That means all rooms should be just blocked until that one meeting room is set up, right? So that is pessimistic locking. The other way is uh, optimistic locking where you only abort when at the right uh, time the serialization fails, then you abort the transaction, right? So that is optimistic locking where you allow the transactions to go through and you and at the very end, you try to serialize it. And when the serialization fails or if any of these guarantees fail, wherein you know, your premise was falsified or someone else updated or if there was no, not easily serializable, then you fail that transaction. So there are many ways in which the database supports serializability, but if we don't understand it and if we just assume that these guarantees are provided, then we will not use the right lock mechanism. Then we will not have the right ways to abort and retie. And the users could have data in a very inconsistent state. So it's very, very important for us to understand how transactions work, what sort of guarantees the software that we rely on actually provides those guarantees, and how true are they in their implementation, right? Because there could be weak guarantees, there could be strong guarantees, right? Um, the number one thing I learned from this uh, was not only various concepts here, but it's important to dig in as to what is the set of guarantees that your software provides or what your database system provides so that you can build systems in such a way that your data is consistent, your data is accurate for your users all the time. Thanks.